And I want to show you at this point a little, because I didn't assign the reading from Plato because it's just too long for one class, the allegory of the cave. And it's just a little video. It's like three, four minutes. And what Plato is going to do here is show the divided line in another way of representing it. He presents it as a story. I'll play it here and I hope you can hear it. Let me see if it's actually loud enough. Imagine footprints that extend their entire lives shaped deep inside a cave. They have been chained so that they cannot see behind themselves. And they are forced to stare endlessly at the cave wall in front of them. Behind them, a fire is burning. And between the prisoners and the fire is a raised walkway. Now imagine that each day a menagerie of objects crosses the walkway. Animals, people carrying their wares to market. Their shapes create an intricate shadow play on the wall in front of the prisoners. This is the only world that the prisoners have ever known. The shadows, the echoes of unseen objects. Now, imagine that the prisoner is released. After some time adjusting to the blinding light, the free prisoner will begin to experience the world outside the cave for the very first time. And it's like nothing he could have ever imagined. With his new perception of the world, the man will force him to return to his friends for sharing his incredible discoveries. But the prisoners cannot recognize their own friend. He appears as all things do. His voice <coughs> is a distorted echo, and his body is a grotesque shadow. They cannot understand his fantastic stories of the world outside of the cave. To them, it will never exist. This, of course, does not make the world outside of the cave. Any less real. And cue the funky music. Um, so let me put this up here. <coughs> the cave and the allegory of the cave is an illustration of this. The cave is down here, effectively. And the shadows and images on the wall of the cave come from the portrait of physical objects that are on the stage behind them. And there's the sunlight that's, or, or, the, or the flame that's casting a, sh a light and, and on the wall behind the spectators, right? The spectators are looking at the wall of the cave Behind them, there's a sort of a walkway with a big fire that's casting shadows on it. Now, that fire is just a shadow compared to the real light, which is the light of the sun. And even that's just an allegory of what real light is. Real light is illumination. It's the thing by which we see other things, right? We require light to see. <clears throat> but true light is intellectual light. It's not visible light. Visible light will illuminate physical objects, but it won't illuminate intellectual categories. But that's the sort of illumination that we need in order to be able to think, to think in terms of 
mathematical reasoning, or even here, higher than that, dialectic, logic. That will lead us up here. So from the cave, let's put up here like the sun. You're taken out there. Now the person that takes you out into the sunlight, or rather is taken into the sunlight, is the philosopher. Note how he was taken out. So let me draw my famously excellent drawings. And that was ironic, in case you didn't realize. So this is the allegory of the cave. Let's have a cave here. It goes up, and then there's this sort of walkway up here. And then there are figures here on, doesn't have a tail. Um, and there's a fire here behind him that makes the light cast a shadow on here. And there are prisoners down here sitting on chairs strapped to them and viewing what's on the shadows from this fire of the light, right? These are prisoners. This is life. Life is being chained to a chair watching shadows on the wall of a cave. That's what normal human life is. We watch shadows and think we know what the world is like. And the shadows are the one is the world that's been told to us by the poets and the philosophers and the theologians, not the philosophers, the poets and the theologians are telling us what the world's like, and we're just listening to what they say. And we're we're judging that justice is just like we see it in the puppet play, the shadow play behind us here. That's what justice is. Plato says that a man who uh, is moved by philosophy has to be dragged up here, out of the cave, out of the tunnel, up into the light, and he can't even see, that's not a light, that's a star. As I say, famously good. That's the light. Sun. Dragged out into the sun to see, and he's blinded by it when he first, and he, he's trying to struggle to, you know, see things. And when he sees things clearly for the first time, he sees them in their pure forms, and the, the way in which the shadows are like the telegram, that far removed for it, he's going to say to these guys that he left behind, he's going to run down and tell them, that's not reality. Reality is like this. And what will be his reward for it? They'll, they'll hate him and want to kill him. Because they like the fictions. They like the illusions. They would rather live in unreality then deal with somebody who is making them question everything they believe to be true about the gods and the underworld and whatever. That will, be the, that will be the reward for the philosopher. They will hate the one who tells them the truth. And Socrates is the illustration for this. He's going to be the illustration for this because that was what he did. He went around questioning the wise prisoner sitting facing the wall just like he is saying, oh, you're wise? Yes, oh, I'm wise. Well, tell me about the nature of justice or whatever, and they'll tell him based on this. He'll ask questions, and it'll become clear that the man sitting in the stool beside him is just as ignorant as he is, except that he thinks he's smart. That's the only difference. He doesn't realize that he's ignorant. And through a series of dialectic, logical discussions, he'll prove to him that justice is not, as Thrasymachus says it, it has to be like this. So then it becomes a picture to some degree about that involves the uh, very helpful metaphors of shadows and light and sunlight and illumination, etc. And that's the life of the philosopher. Does that make sense so far? Any questions provoked by this? First time you've heard this? No, not for all of you. Okay, well, that's good. You're better off than I was. Say, when I came to university, I'd never heard this. I just thought it was extraordinary and very helpful. And also, it helped me deal with something that I was observing coming to university. I was being asked to question things and think about what we mean by the things that most motivate us. Love, justice, such things. What do we mean by that? The, uh, the, the singers sing about love all the time. What is love? What, what exactly is it? I mean, I'm in love. Okay, what? Yeah, I mean, I know you know, you think you know what that means, but what does that mean? Does it allow you to do this and that? 
Uh, no, so you can put, and okay, so it's not, so once you start investigating it, then you start to get into, well, what do we mean by that? Well, what's not love then? Does it allow you to do this? Does it allow you to do that? Where, what are the limitations on it? How is this a just expression of love? How is this unjust? Well, what's the definition then? So we're starting to get into the realm of philosophy, which Aristotle says basically is the science of definitions. Philosophy is coming up with the terms to think about things clearly. Now, when he makes this critique of the poets, I think that the poets present the very same thing. As, as Aristotle said, Oedipus effectively shows in a very powerful way what the philosophical Socrates already shows, that human beings who think that they know who they are don't know who they are. They're showing something profound about the ignorance of the human condition, the ignorance we have towards our own human condition, even though we're trying to solve the problem. Come Christian theology, we're going to get better answers than Aristotle because they're revealed. And again, what a human being is, is one of the issues there. And how we relate to God, well, there is only one God. That's also revealed. But although Aristotle is going to lean that way, and so is Socrates or, or, and Plato, they're going to start leaning towards the idea of there must be one good, there must be one just, there must be one beauty, there must be one truth, and they have to be integrated in some way. Well, Christian theology is going to connect all of those simple attributes to the character of God. God is good, God is just, God is loving, God is true. All of those things are true of God. And we long for those things. We appeal to those things. So even though we don't experience them, we long for them and we know they're there, which is why we perceive injustice and ugliness and falsehood. We know what falsehood is. And the world still works in accordance with, with truth and goodness and beauty. That's the way the world works. It doesn't work when those things are not functioning in any way. And the subject of education is to pursue goodness, beauty, truth, justice more closely. And that results in a better person and a better society. <clears throat> so one of the things that you, when you come to university, uh, you're told that, you know, you do, you do a degree and then you go out and get a real job. When you get a real job, you're going to find that you don't have the time or the leisure to do what you're doing right now, but what you're doing right now is going to prepare you for life to be able to live a good human life when you do your jobs. This is not a good job preparation, by the way. What I'm teaching you is not going to prepare you for a job. It is going to prepare you to live as a human being, which is important. It's very important. There, there's, I don't think, anything more important, and I think we need to hear it. Anyway. Observations about Plato's allegory of the cave. Note again that the man has to be dragged out, and then actually what Plato says a little bit later on in this dialogue is he has to be forced to go back in as well. The philosopher actually has to be compelled to go back down into the cave and tell people that they're wrong. Why does he have to be compelled? Because his reward is you're going to get beaten up and killed. Who wants to do that? Now, Christians, when they come to this passage, are going to say, that's a lot like witnessing to the gospel, isn't it? You're going to tell people what they don't want to hear. And how are they going to receive it? They're going to receive it often with great hostility. But it's the very thing that's going to save them from the injustice that they themselves perpetrate and complain about it at the same time. That's the problem. The problem uh, of human nature is that everybody is like Oedipus, not in what he specifically does, but everyone's guilty before the, the, the face of God, before the throne of God above, everyone's guilty. That's not a very happy message. Now, what God does in response to it is a very happy message. It's good news. He'll send his son, but you have to believe in what he did. Sure. 
And when you do that, then it's like the light of the, the true sun transforming your whole intellectual life and your, your acts, your deeds, your thoughts, your character, everything. It, it's transformative. If the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. You're liberated from your own sense of inadequacy, your own sense of being victimized, which many people are now and always have been, but more and more our society gets more and more unjust. People are victimized by people that should be protecting them. They're thrust into situations which they're not capable of dealing with, and there's a lot of confusion around them. There's, there's very little justice in the world, very little love. But it, when you're transformed by the sun, it is transformative, literally. You are turned towards the light, and you walk in the light, and then the light transforms your whole walk of life. Comments, questions, you must have something to say. When I first started teaching this class, you gave a lot of, your hands were shooting up, now you're quiet. I don't know if that's good or bad. Yes. It's the perfect, so if you want it, a form is like the perfect, so in this sense, a, an experience of justice, well, here's the perfection of justice. But the perfect form of a man is the best, like a man without flaws. What does that look like? What does a man without flaws look like? You, may, you might say it's certain physical description, you know, ideal, masculine, beauty, whatever, or perfect feminine beauty, but it's also gonna relate to the form of a man, which we've already said, his reason, orders his whole uh, being. Everything he does is rational, and it's ordered by his goodness, and it's ordered by a sense of what's just and right, and that's what the perfect man is. So that is the form. The form is the perfection of whatever we, we see around us. That's the form. You're there to do things perfectly. So yes? Correct. So a physical object would be like a fire, as opposed to the light of the sun. So the, per the perfect form of light might be the sun, but even the sun actually is a physical object in the sky. And really the real light is an inner light, not an outer light. It's an inner light. It's a correspondence. The sun is actually a microcosm of a greater light, which is not a physical light, but it's a true light. It's a light that allows us to think clearly and to see things that are perfect and the most perfect thing of all is God and so even the physical world that God has created for us I'm speaking as a Christian now is a ladder that allows us to come closer and closer and see more and more clearly and that's what education should be I said that actually when I was introduced to all the first years so that um, going up your grade a grade is a step you go first grade second grade you're not just a year older you're going up a step and at the end of all those steps, you graduate. Or you get a graduate degree, you get a PhD like me, and you get a doctorate. So that means that you can teach. That's what the word doctorate means. You're a teacher. Okay, but a teacher is at, at the top, but he still actually has a place to go. There's, there's always ways in which you can continue to move towards the light. And now you're just somebody who has some illumination leading other people with you along that path onwards and upwards. Again, the metaphor that most commonly used in Christ the Christian faith is like a pilgrimage, like in Hebrews 12, those who walk by faith, etc. And they were, what are they walking towards? A city whose architect and builder was God. That's what says Abraham. Abraham, by faith, left his land of Ur to go to a country that he did not know, but he was heading towards a city, it says. I don't see that in Genesis. I see that in Hebrews. He says he was going towards a city. And that's the divine pilgrimage we're all on. And it's an onwards and upwards voyage. So yes, it helps to have that sense. Like, I'm doing English. I'm doing philosophy. I'm doing psychology. I'm doing what? 
yeah, but all of it is part of the journey going somewhere. You're going somewhere with this. It's not job prep, it's life prep. And the job's a part of your life, but it's not the whole of your life. Not even the most important, perhaps. You're going to probably be given a job you don't want for a time. And you have to do it. You get paid to do it, all right. As long as it's not dishonest work, okay. But what remains a part of that is you. Are you growing? So that, but that's what's meant there, physical object. So this, this physical object could just be like a fire, the campfire. And you could say, well, then the true light is the sun up here, as I've suggested. But actually, that's just a physical object as well. So it's just a little higher up the chain, the sun. But the real illumination is a non-physical illumination. So, it, And from the Greek world, then, we get a huge emphasis on the inner life. The life of the mind, the life of the soul. It's not the same thing, but something of the importance of what happens inside of you, that matters to God. It's not just what you do on the outside. That's what the Greek gods can see. Have you sacrificed enough bulls? The Bible will say it doesn't matter how many bulls you've sacrificed. What do I care about that? What do I want? A pure heart. Right? Because the, the, there's a problem here, and it goes so deep your external acts can't solve the problem. You need to be born again. You need to be cleansed from within. The light needs to go so deep that all of the darkness is dispelled. And the Greeks are pointing us that way already by talking about the real reality is what happens in here. And I can't do justice out there until I have justice inside of me. So again, the Greeks are helpful in this. They're not the last word, but they're the beginning of the conversation. Again, Put this alongside the Bible, and they you'll find that they work together very well. Other comments or questions? <clears throat> this is the, one of the most influential texts ever written. Uh, Cicero will talk about it in um, his own work, The Republic, and he'll give it a Roman take on it, but he's effectively still appealing to Plato. Nope. Okay, so let me say something about Book 10 then. Book 10 is the last book in Plato's Republic. The last book. And he concludes it by rejecting any form of art that just imitates reality. Like presents it as a shadow. Imitation is not going to take us where we want to be. You have to see the thing directly. Not an image of it, but the real thing. He acts as if this is a possibility. Says it's what the philosopher does. And he then presents all sorts of weird theories that we're probably not going to agree with, but he suggests that the soul is immortal, which becomes a heresy in the Christian church when they first listen to Plato on that. We don't have uh, the immortality of the soul is not a Christian doctrine. And furthermore, he, he presents the idea of reincarnation. When I said it's, we have an immortal person, but the psyche, as he means it, this intellectual being that has nothing to do with our bodies, that's not Christian doctrine. Christian doctrine will say your body is a part of who you are. In the Platonic conception, it, your soul, your disembodied self is who you are. Your body is not you. That's ple played out there. Anyway. I saw you a little confused. He presents a theory of reincarnation and then gives a, a vision of the just life that comes out of it, and he concludes with the sort of a myth. Um, it's called the myth of Ur, E-R. And I won't get into the myth of Ur. But that it's a little weird conclusion. But in book 10, he throws the philosopher or the poets out of the ideal city says the ideal city will be governed by philosophers, not by poets. So it's an educational treatise in that sense. Who should be the educators? Those who claim that justice is getting what you deserve 
which is what the rich and the powerful do. Or the social justice warriors will say, well, getting what the poor deserve, that's what justice is. And we'll say, no, that's not what justice is in either case. You've got to leave the city. We need somebody that actually deals with justice in a perfect form. That's going to be the educator, and that's going to be the poet. So he throws the poets out, Homer and all the rest, and introduces the idea of the philosopher as, as the uh, person that is best there to lead the polis or the city-state. Comments, questions? I'm going to end early, otherwise, yes. In book 10, he talks about the immortality of the soul. Reincarnation. Now, where does he get that from? He actually gets that from the poets. In Plato, in uh, Plato, in Homer's underworld, you live, you're, you're in the realm of the dead for a thousand years, and then you're dipped in the river, river Lethe, which makes you forget your identity, and then you're born to another body, depending on how you acted in this life. That's the theory that Plato propounds. Thought, held by other cultures as well. It's a theory of reincarnation. Your soul remains. That's not a physical being. Your physical body's gone, but your soul lives on and then it gets reincarnated. So the, the reincarnated body, the body itself is not you. It's a disembodied self that is you. Christianity is going to say, actually, when you bear the image of God, there's a physical component to that, which is why in Romans 12 it says, offer up your bodies as a living sacrifice for this is your spiritual act of worship. It's not going to divide the two. Your body and your spirit are connected. Remember, Christ, who is God, took on flesh. He was a real man. He didn't appear to be a man. He was a man. He was crucified bodily and he was raised bodily and he ascended bodily. The bodily aspect of Christ's human nature is not accidental and not irrelevant it's essential to his human nature just like the incarnation he was born of a virgin in a manger that was a baby there there was a human being there and it had a body so that's going to when i said an individual and a rational individual was part of the greek definition not good enough he has a human body as well human beings have human bodies human persons and their bodies are important to their identity if I punch you in the nose, I punched you, not just your nose. You were assaulted, not your nose. <laughs> your nose got the hit, but it was you that got hit because we have bodies. Bodies are essential to our human nature. For the Greeks, they'll say, of course, I felt that, but that's not really me. I can conceive of myself an abstraction from that. I can't ignore it, but I, the, the, I should act as if I... We're not an embodied being. So it begins a sort of a Gnosticism. It opens up as a result of that. It becomes an early church heresy. As I say, Plato begins the conversation. He's not the last word. Yes? So um, you mentioned briefly that the uh, Romans uh, reflected a lot on Plato's Republic. Uh, Cicero, I said, did. Yeah. Yes? Uh, does this mean that they... No, nope. no. I mean, the the Greek the Romans are the Greeks' inferiors in almost everything. They tend to imitate the Greeks. They are superior in certain respects. They are superior in government. They know how to rule and to hold on to their rule. They're famous for their justice system. Famous for their justice system, and they're famous for their <coughs> for their military and famous for their order. The Greeks are very individualistic. The Romans are more collective. They act as one. Like we know, but the Greeks occasionally, they're really good at, like the Spartans. The Spartans are warriors, and they act as a group, and they fight as a group, and there's no individuals there. They all... The Romans are like that in spades. They act totally collectively. The Greeks are very individualistic. But in terms of their intellectual life, their philosophy, their poetry, it is, uh, in general, inferior to the Greeks. And they know it. 
which is why they continue to read the Greeks. The literate people of the, even the, uh, you know, even Cicero's day, he's reading Greek. He reads Greek, he writes Greek, he had a Greek teacher. The teachers remain Greeks. They read Greek culture, they are modeling themselves on Greek culture. Interesting. So this is the, this typical of Rome. Whatever is best, we're going to take that and we'll make it our own. That's what I was proposing to you. You don't have to become Greeks, but if it's, if it's the best thing going, we'll start with that then. It's a pragmatic decision. Uh, I didn't talk about books uh, eight and nine. There's, he introduces all sorts of political concepts there. I'm not going to get into that here, but it's all there. Different types of regimes. There's aristocrats and democracies, etc. Yes. Uh, what happens books two and four? Uh, books two and four are are dealing with the uh, microcosm macrocosm topic that I suggested there. I got here in my notes. Oh, the, yeah, the city and the soul. So books two to four expand on that. So having justice, book one, let's talk about the soul on the one hand and the city on the other and talk about how they are basically parallels to each other. The idea of the what? No, the Greeks accept this very commonly. There's no dispute over the fact that everything is related to everything else in some ways and that you can get a small version and a larger version of it. Yeah. Oh, in the narrative, not really. Like once Socrates puts down his opponents, then he is just basically goes on monologues. And they, you know, the people he's speaking to are just sort of like, yes, Socrates, of course, Socrates. It must be so, Socrates, but there isn't really any argument anymore. So there's an extended, this is just Socrates talking and somebody saying, yes, you're right. Of course, how could it be otherwise? Yes, yeah. And there's a lot in the Republic. The, but the argument takes place in book one. Some people think that it was written separately from the rest of it as, a, as its own thing. And then so uh, Plato adds the uh, discussion there. That, that could be. Any other? Yes? How does this um, uh, drive? You want me to put this back up? I can do that. Go ahead. Yeah, so we're getting a little bit of the return of uh, you're talking about something like this. Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, that sort of thing. Oops. Abstract and impractical. Yeah. But that's not necessarily it should not be, and this is why, again, he applies it to the city, because it, it's fine and good to think the right thoughts, but you have to have them you have to act upon those. And in, in the realm of the world, you have to enact it politically. So in the city, it's not enough to think the right things. You have to make sure that that is presented politically in the system of law and order. And they should work together. And the ideal there is the Renaissance ideal of being the philosopher king. You ought to be doing both. 
You ought to think the right thoughts, and then you ought to do the right actions on the basis of the right thoughts. It's not good enough to think the right things. They're not sufficient. Although you have to first think the right things before you can do the right things. You don't just intuitively know what's right. Or even if you do, you need to be sure that it's not just self-interest. Maslow presents this in, in terms of, this is why it came to mind what you said there, the hierarchy of human needs. He says, the highest needs of meaning and inner potential you only get after you've done, you've achieved all these things. So they're there for an elite. And it may sound like it's following Plato here. I don't think he is, actually. I think that you need love down here just as much as you need the physiological needs of breathing, food, water, shelter, clothing, sleep. If you don't have love, you don't give a baby love. You can feed the baby. But if you don't cuddle the baby, hold the baby, the baby dies. It's been demonstrated. You, the, it can be nourished as much as you want with all the right conditions, but the baby's not given love, the baby dies. People who are not given love shrink, they wither and die. Same with the acceptance, it's morality, it's all of these things that he presents as a hierarchy, as if you only get these after you've satisfied these things, I think is just distorted. Again, the, these are material and these are not material. So it suggests that there's a sort of, you can only get these things after you've got that. Well, who says that? That's Marxist thinking. That's materialism is the basis of human life. I don't agree. Of course you need material things. If you don't have food, clothing, shelter, water, then you can't live. But if you don't have love, you can't live. If you don't have justice, you can't live. If you have no freedom, you can't live as a human being. If you put somebody in solitary confinement, you will die. It's a form of torture. Geneva Convention. Those are, all, those are just as essential as here. So it's not a hierarchy. It's all of these are needed. And you're, you're presenting a portrait here that distorts the truth. Comment at the back. Of, yes. Now, go ahead. He does. Yeah, so on, that, so on the, um, the divided line there, he's suggesting the forms are higher and he presents them as intellectual and those are superior and he neglects the political, physical, practical ways and that's the critique of the philosophers and I will make that critique as well. He suggests something like this and that's the way the world looks at things. Invariably, all religions, with the exception of Christianity, all religions think that the spiritual is more important than the physical. The Christian will say both. You can't act as if our soul is up here and our body is down here. It's the same person. That's my point. We, in, we, we lean towards Gnosticism, the heresy of the, 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 the spirit being uh, the essential self and the body not being a part of that. Or like it's like noise. The body's just noise. And I say, well, but in the incarnation, God takes on a human body. He seems to think that's important to human nature. He didn't appear to do it. He did it. He suffered hunger. He suffered rejection. He reject he, the rejection of the father, rejection of his friends, rejection of the crowds. He experienced huge injustice. Remember, he treated people better than we've ever treated anyone in our lives. And what did he get for it? He got the cross. So he experienced, did he experience those things in his mind or in his body? Both. Of course. And he experienced it in a way that we never have, because he experienced it from the Father as well. The, the God never gives us the experience that we speak about of total rejection, but he himself did. Jesus received total rejection even from the Father. My God, my God, why, why hast thou forsaken me? That's the cry of the Son. Total. Right? Why? For our sake. Huge. Not the way the world thinks about it. This is Maslow. He's wrong. This is Plato. He's wrong. But you know what they're saying. They're saying something that's true, but it's, it distorts the, the right picture. Only Christianity gives you the right way of looking at these things. Is that helpful at all? I mean, we're just touching on this. You're going to keep thinking about this, I hope. 
Anyone else? All right, I'm done for today. So 